You're listening to the weekly sermon at Second Baptist Church in Cedartown, Georgia. Second Baptist Cedartown exists to worship God, disciple believers, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 1. Hebrews chapter number 1. That's where we're going to be at this morning. And uh, starting a new sermon series this morning. Again, uh, so grateful for Independence Day today uh, as a nation, something that is worthy of celebrating and thanking God for uh, those foundational principles uh, that our nation was founded on. And then we can just, you know, take some time and celebrate America, which is all right. I mean, in this day and age, even with all the political correctness and whatnot, I like to take some time and celebrate America and uh, to thank God uh, for this nation. And, uh, you know, yesterday I showed Jack the joys of Roman candles and smoke bombs, and that was a lot of fun. You know, we like to do stuff like that around the 4th of July. And I saw a picture a while back on Facebook of uh, how Europeans think Americans eat breakfast. And the picture was a big old plate of bacon, massive plate of bacon, and it had a Glock next to it. (laughs) A, a Bible right on this side. And I, I shared it and I said, it needs more bacon <laughs> because, you know, I mean, it was a big old plate, but man, that's, you know, it, it's all right to, to say God bless America today. Uh, it's all right to go back to our founding principles and say, you know what, well, we're not a perfect country, uh, but we were based on good principles, godly principles. And I believe it's okay for us to say that we have been an exceptional country, uh, a country that has been a beacon of hope and freedom uh, around the world, uh, all because, not because of um, really the efforts of men as frail as we are, but because of the sovereign hand of God. God is the one who uh, raises up nations and leaders. Uh, God is the one who allows us to gather. God is the one who gives to us our freedom and our liberties God is the one who protects us and goes with us and before us. And so first and foremost, as a nation, we need to remember that. We need to be mindful of that, of the supremacy of Christ. I love the battle cry of one revolutionary leader as they were uh, preparing for war and as they declared their independence from Great Britain and the King of England. His battle cry was this, that in America we have no king but Jesus. And may that be our battle cry again today. No king but Jesus. And he is king. He is Lord over all. We worship him. We adore him. We glorify his name. And so that's why we want to uh, really start a new series in the book of Hebrews Uh, We're going to be talking a lot about Jesus, our great Christ is how I've phrased this as we've, uh, as I've studied through this particular book, it speaks a lot about Jesus. And I'm going to look at Hebrews chapter one, starting in verse one. If you found your place, let's all stand out of reverence to reading God's holy word this morning. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which the angels of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. 
You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. Let's pray together. God, we come to you together today, and we thank you for your inerrant and inspired word. Lord, we thank you for the fact that there is nothing wrong with your word, that you are here with us even now, and you speak to us, Lord. God, I I pray that you would move in our hearts. Help us, God, as a nation to turn back to you, Lord, to repent to turn away from our sinful ways of idolatry, of materialism, of greed, of lust. Lord, all of the things that our flesh has allowed to take over in this day and age, there is a pandemic of sin in our nation. And God, we pray that you would forgive us, heal us, Lord. And Lord, we pray for revival in our lands. We pray for our leaders, that they would turn to you, God, that they would reject the principles of this world and instead embrace the principles of your holy word. Lord, your truth endures forever. And Lord, I pray that it would endure in our heart today and that you would guide us into obedience, help us to trust in you more, to worship Jesus more fervently, and to care for you and to love you with all of our heart. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Starting a new study through the book of Hebrews, and it'll probably take us through at least the end of September, just depending on how the Lord leads. But I'm looking forward to preaching through this wonderful book. It's a book that is really all about Jesus and who he is. It's a Christ exalting book, a wonderful book summary of Christ. And, you know, the obvious question I think that has to be addressed with Hebrews is one that people have tried to address for years and years and years. Who exactly wrote the book of Hebrews? And many have given their thoughts over the years and have studied the question. Martin Luther believed that Paul wrote Hebrews, as did many people in church tradition. But he also suggested it may have been Apollos, who was the author, There's a few reasons why some advocate for Paul as the writer. Uh, It's in line with church history. Many early church fathers like Clement and Origen, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, attributed the writing of the book of Hebrews to Paul. The sequence of books in early manuscripts, when historians look at how the manuscripts were organized, they were next to the book of Hebrews, the The manuscripts for the book of Hebrews were next to some of the other Pauline writings as well, some of the letters that Paul himself wrote. Some of the language seems to be in line with Paul, the way that he wrote, the eloquence of his words. He uses some similar phrases that Paul used in other books as well. But then there's also some other things to consider, I think, too. The the writer doesn't introduce himself as we opened up the book of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 there is not the usual introduction like we would see with typical letters that Paul wrote Paul and others but definitely Paul Uh, he really also uh, there are some things that are in the book of Hebrews that are not characteristic of the writings of Paul there's over 150 words in the book of Hebrews that that are not utilized anywhere else in the New Testament And so the book of Hebrews does in some ways stand alone as a unique book because there are plenty of words that are not utilized in other places. And then I think another consideration we have to think about whether or not this was Paul. The writer of Hebrews claims to have heard the gospel secondhand by those who had been with Jesus. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 more specifically uh, the writer of Hebrews uh, claims to not have heard this first hand not have heard the gospel first hand and Paul always always claimed to have a personal encounter with Jesus 
And usually it was in the context of Paul defending his apostolic authority as one who had been with Jesus, who had not received this message secondhand, but one who had been there, who had actually seen and experienced the presence of Christ. So who exactly wrote it? Honestly, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. All of that in many ways, I think, is a side note. I believe the true author of Hebrews is the Holy Spirit, as in any other passage of Scripture. God utilizes humans to pin these words down, and and many times that is important to understand the context of what's being said and to whom it is being said. But I think in this case, the Lord just didn't want us to know exactly who the writer of the book of Hebrews is. I think he wants us to remind ourselves that the true author of Holy Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is the Holy Spirit himself. If God wanted us to know, I think he would have told us. And so the focus is not on any one person, any human in all of his frailty. The focus is on Christ. It's a masterful and eloquent summary of the supremacy of Christ, of how Jesus reigns supreme over all. How he is greater than anything else in this world. And I do believe that it is inerrant, that it is inspired by our holy God, our holy and righteous God. So my main point this morning is Jesus is greater than we could ever imagine. And the Bible shows us who he is. Now, by the way, you don't necessarily have to know who the writer of Hebrews is to trust in the words that are written here in the book of Hebrews. There's lots of questions that we have about the Bible that we have about particular passages of the Bible. We don't know exactly when the book of Job was written, for instance. We think it's the oldest story in the Bible, but but we don't know a whole lot about many aspects of the book of Job. And yet, God still utilizes books like the book of Hebrews for his glorious purposes. We still have more manuscripts of the New Testament with Hebrews included, we still have more manuscripts than uh, other ancient documents that we trust in that we read about all the time, other secular ancient documents. And so there are thousands more manuscripts that verify the existence, the validity of books like the books, the book of Hebrews. And so we can trust it historically. We can trust it spiritually that it is the word of the living God. It is consistent with everything else that God has revealed in Scripture. And Hebrews is a wonderful, glorious summary of just how supreme Christ is. The fact that Jesus is greater than we could ever imagine. And we need to remind ourselves when we're pursuing this question of how do we describe Jesus, we need to root ourselves in the Word of God. Look to the Bible for us to understand exactly who Jesus is. The world has a lot of other definitions for Jesus. The world has a lot of other pictures of of how they want to paint Jesus, of how they want Jesus to look. But Christian, when we are asked this question, how do you describe Jesus? We need to go directly to the Word of of the living God. There are many things when people ask us about certain spiritual issues, when they ask about what, what, what's heaven going to be like, who is Jesus, what did Jesus come to do, what should we do as a church, how should the church exist today, how do we engage in politics, what would Jesus say about this, what would Jesus say about that, all of these questions we ultimately need to search the scriptures to answer these questions. Not our opinions, not our hearts, our own minds. Look to the scriptures, what God has already said, how he has already spoken. For us to answer this question, how do you describe Jesus? Well, how does Jesus describe himself? How does Jesus describe himself? The word of God in the book of Hebrews is so clear in so many different ways. And I want to spend some time on that in the next several weeks. Number one, Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word. Look with me in verse 2. God who at various times, various ways, spoken times in the past of the prophets. In verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things. I think one of the most amazing things to me when I contemplate, when I think about the nature of God is just how God has interacted with mankind. 
just how God has uh, involved himself in the daily affairs of men. God could communicate in any way that he wanted to. He's God. He's sovereign. He's Lord over all. He could do whatever it is that he wanted to do, say whatever it is, however he wants to say it. He could simply make something appear in the clouds if he wanted to speak to us, if he wanted to show his sovereignty and, and communicate to us in a particular way. He could just make things happen if he wanted to. He, he could take a thought. He could just plant it in your mind if you wanted to do that. But the reality is God chose to use words and God continues to use words this is something that's very uh, important when we think about the nature of God and how he communicates to us but but then just how he has revealed himself God chose to use words somebody said that to preach the gospel use words if necessary can I tell you this words are necessary they're necessary because god has spoken to us and revealed to us through his holy inerrant and inspired word and in order for us to communicate this message to the outside world listen it matters how you live your life it matters that you have a good christian witness but you must use words to communicate the gospel why god used words he has revealed it in his word he has shown to us and described to us the very nature of who he is and the nature of salvation, how you come to him. Words are necessary. God chose to use that and he continues to use words. God spoke this world into existence. Think about the very nature of that power and authority. The refrain that we hear over and over again in Genesis in the beginning is, then God said... Then God said, let there be light. Then God said, let us make man in our own image. Then God said, let the firmament be created, the heavens and the earth and the stars also. Then God said. God spoke to the prophets in the Old Testament. The writer of Hebrews acknowledges that. In verse 1, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Sometimes he spoke through a theophany. That's a $4 word, but it just really is God showing up in a burning bush. That's an example of a theophany, some sort of appearance, like what we see in, uh, in the book of Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God has manifested himself in some sort of way as a theophany. Sometimes it was through a, a messenger angel that delivered a particular message when God spoke to the prophets of old. Sometimes God spoke through the writing on the wall, as we saw with Daniel as well. So that is how God spoke in the Old Testament. Spoke using words by the prophets. But then there's a shift. There's a change that takes place. During the time Jesus was on earth, God spoke through the person of Jesus Christ. The apostles, those that had been with Jesus, that's the definition of an apostle. There's not an apostle alive today no matter what the claim is in some churches, there are no apostles. That's not a title. That's not a role in the church. The apostles are those that had literally been with Jesus. And they wrote it down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, especially with the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit because they had been with Jesus. They had walked with him. They had seen him. They had written these things down. And collectively, we have this gospel that's been passed down to us today. God speaks today primarily through his final and completed word. God speaks to us. He uses words even to this day. And that's important for us. It's important for us to be mindful of, to understand exactly what God does, how God speaks in many ways. But when I want to tell you this, when the Bible speaks, God speaks. I've heard this said uh, before, I've mentioned it before, uh, that if you want to hear the Word of God, you should open up your Bible. If you want to hear the Word of God audibly, read your Bible out loud. 
And I think that's so true because when the Bible speaks, God speaks. John chapter 1, the gospel of John tells us this. In the beginning was the word, the logos is the Greek term. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word was spoken through Jesus and then the word was recorded by the apostles and it is final, it is complete, there is nothing we should add to or take away. God's word, as Isaiah says, will endure forever and ever. And so as believers, we trust in this holy and inerrant word. We don't worship this Bible, we worship the God of this Bible. And we lift him up as he is revealed to us. The word in John chapter 1 is referring both to the Bible and Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is the personification of the word. This is a major reason why I believe in cessationism, which just basically means that the giftings of the apostles were for the apostles. Does God speak today? Yes. But God doesn't speak through a secret prayer language or a secret spiritual language or through unknown tongues. God does speak, but it may be more accurate today to say that God has spoken and God continues to speak to this day. He speaks through the revelation of Jesus. He speaks through the proclamation of His Word. He speaks through the movement of His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is still here to minister to us, to speak to us through His holy and inerrant Word. Listen, if we want to understand something about the book, why don't we go to the author? If you want the, the, the Word to be manifest in your heart, if you want to grow in your relationship with the Lord through reading and studying His Word, listen, you have the Holy Spirit as the author of this Word speaking to you as you study, as you go through and read His Holy Word. The Holy Spirit does a work in our heart as we read this Bible. And I'm so grateful, so grateful for that. But it's obvious in Hebrews chapter 1 that God has spoken at various times in different ways. God spoke in the Old Testament through the prophets. He spoke in the Gospels through Jesus. He speaks to us today through the faith that Jude says is once and for all delivered to the saints. Once and for all. Meaning it's signed, it's done, it's sealed, it's, it's no longer added to or taken away from. We have this word that we have inherited by a work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Word. And He is speaking to us as we read, as we study, as we grow in Christ's likeness and in grace. Jesus is also a creator God. Now I've got five points, <laughs> more than my typical three, but I'm going to move through these fairly quickly, I think. Jesus is creator God. You know, some people really like Jesus, even those that aren't believers, those that wouldn't identify as Christ followers or as Christians or as people who believe the Bible is an inerrant, inspired word of God. There are people out there in the world who really like some aspects of Jesus. They like the things that he said about, you know, peace and the things that he has said about uh, pursuing uh, love and all of these things and grace and everything else. But whether or not they realize that sometimes people demote Jesus in how they speak of him. Even Christians, maybe sometimes we unknowingly or unwittingly, we demote who Jesus is or we try to demote him. It's easy to think about God the Father as creator because the account of creation is at the very beginning of the Old Testament. It's the opening words of the Old Testament. Many, many years before Jesus personally came and dwelt among this earth. So it's easy to think about God the Father as creator. But, but the Bible is abundantly clear that all three persons of the Trinity were there in creation. And Jesus is just as much creator as the Father. Jesus is just as much creator as the Spirit. Genesis, we read these words, let us make man in our own image. The word is the Hebrew term Elohim. And many times it is referring to God in a plural sense, not many gods, but but this is what it means. It it literally means this, that God is so immense, that God is so powerful, that that it almost, he, he seems 
in one unit, he seems so voluminous that he could overtake anything and everything that would come in his path. Think of it along the, these lines of, of a massive army that has gathered together for battle and for war. Hundreds of hundreds of men that are gathered together and, and they're able to, to overpower their enemy. Why? Because they're so immense in their power. And when we talk about this massive army, it is one army made up of many people. But that's the picture of Elohim, that, that God is so immense in His power that He's voluminous in who He is and He's able to overtake anything and everything that comes in His path. Let us make man in our own image, the Word says in Genesis. All three persons of the Trinity were there in creation. Now, this is something that is interesting for us to think about. It's not just in Genesis, but Colossians chapter 3 mentions that as well, Jesus being there in creation. Here in Hebrews, Jesus was present and active in creation. It says in verse 2, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. It's talking about Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Jesus is creator God. Here's why that's important. If he wasn't creator, then there was a time when Jesus was not. If, if Jesus is not creator, then there was a time when Jesus himself was created. And if the son was created by the father, then it would mean that the son is less than the father. But we need to remind ourselves of this. Jesus was crucified by the religious elite of his day for a specific reason. And it was really the reason of blasphemy. Jesus came and dwelt among us and Jesus taught and he lived a good and perfect and sinless life. But Jesus also made this radical claim that the religious elite really didn't like. Jesus says, I am that I am. Jesus identified as God. And the religious elite, obviously, didn't like that. Jesus' own claim was that he wasn't just a good prophet or teacher. Jesus' own claim out of his own mouth, those words that were spoken that were recorded by the apostles, Jesus himself said, I am God. Jesus is creator God. We can take the whole story of Scripture, we can take it for what it is and what it says. This is who Jesus is. Thirdly, Jesus is all-powerful. Not only did he create the world, but he sustains it by his powerful hand. Now, I love the song that we just sang before I got up here to preach because it summarizes that so well, that he's the creator and the sustainer of the universe. John Chrysostom said this about this passage. He said, here the Son acts by word for, says he, upholding all things, that is, governing. Christ holds together what would fall to pieces. For to, the, to hold the world together is no less than to make it greater, if one must say a strange thing. For the one, for the one is to bring forth something out of things which are not. But the other, when things have been made are about to fall into non-existence is to hold and fasten them together utterly at variance as they are with each other. This is indeed great and wonderful and a certain proof of exceeding power. Here's, here's what he says when he's talking about this passage. Not only did, did Jesus create all of these things, not only did he put all of these things into existence, listen, he fastened them together and Jesus continues, continues by his sovereign and powerful hand, hold all things in the universe together. Literally, if it wasn't for the hands of Jesus, everything that you and I experience would fall into non-existence. Everything that we see, this universe, this world, everything that keeps spinning just as he says it should spin, it would literally fall into oblivion had it not been for the sovereign hand of God. He holds it all together. He fastens it all together. He keeps it, he sustains it just as he wants to do. Man, what power is that? 
That God in heaven could create all of this and then also sustain it even to this very hour. It's hard to wrap our minds around when we think about this power. Especially when we think about the Trinity. That Jesus is all powerful. The Father is all powerful. The Spirit is all powerful. It's hard to imagine just Jesus being involved in this. How could each person of the Trinity be all powerful? In our sinful state, Power is something that we fight over. When we think about our own flesh, we have a desire for more power. One tries to overpower the other according to the desires of the flesh. That's the way the world works. The disciples even fought over who was the greatest among them. And yet all three persons of the Trinity are equal in power. Not only that, Jesus submitted to the will of the Father as an example to us in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed that the Father's will would be done, not out of weakness, but out of strength and power. The Father looked down at the Son as he was being baptized. He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then the purpose of the Holy Spirit, you think about power, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to point us to Jesus and to the Word, to meet us where we are and to bring us to Christ by convicting us of sin, drawing us into repentance. And the Holy Spirit does that. The Holy Spirit is faithful to point people to Jesus. The three persons of God are co-equal, co-eternal, and consubstantial. They are all powerful. They work together for the glorious fulfillment of the will of of God. There's a question that came up years ago when I was in church. We sang a song in the choir, and the phrase that was sung was talking about God on the cross. And the question was, because I guess we'd never phrased it that way, was it really God that was on the cross? And the reality is we only serve one God. He is three in one. He is perfect in every aspect. So yes, It was God on the cross. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. And all are powerful. And all hold this world together. Listen, that changes everything about how we live our lives. It changes everything about how we approach Jesus. Because Jesus wasn't just a good teacher. Listen, how how we follow the teachings of Jesus when he tells us how we should live our lives, when he tells us the dangers of sin, when he tells us to to go and to sin no more, that changes everything about how we approach what Jesus taught us. We need to believe it. We need to do it. Jesus says, "If if you love me, keep my commandments. That changes how we approach the teachings of Christ. Changes how we approach the promises that Jesus makes. We can trust in the promises of Jesus because Jesus is all-powerful. When Jesus says, I will go away from you, but I will come again, listen, Christian, you can trust in that promise. When Jesus says, I'll send a, a helper for you while I'm gone, we can trust in that promise. When Jesus says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you, listen, you can trust in that promise because it came from Jesus. Because he's all-powerful, because he controls all things, because he himself sustains the universe. Listen, I want to trust. I want to trust in that Jesus. In committing to his will changes everything about how we live our lives if we recognize the all-powerful nature of Jesus. Fourthly, Jesus is merciful. I love this phrase in Hebrews. Chapter 1, he's the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he, had, when he had by himself purged our sins. Oh, I'm so grateful for that. Here's the reality God is just, God is righteous. There is nothing in God that is imperfect. He is perfect. Listen, if there's a preacher on TV or somebody that you watch or listen to on the radio and 
and they don't preach that God is righteous. They don't preach about the wrath of God, the justice of God. Listen, turn it off because that's who God is. God is perfect. He is just. He is righteous. Our sin deserves the wrath of God. Now, we need to really remind ourselves of this. Wrap your mind and your heart around this, that, that our sin deserves the wrath of God. If somebody killed somebody that you love, a murderer, killed someone that you love, and the killer was allowed to go free and to live his life freely and never be arrested, never face his day in court, that would be a travesty of justice. And every one of us would recognize it as such. And here's the reality. Our sin is so offensive to our righteous God that it is punishable by death. What does the Bible tell us? The wages of sin is death. All of our sin is so offensive to God. It's such an injustice against the righteousness of God. It is, in many ways... A travesty of justice if that wrath is not executed on the sinner. Our sin is so offensive to the righteousness of God. But here's the wonderful, glorious message of the gospel. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Jesus is merciful. What we deserved, the punishment of our sin that should have been given to us, that, that literally is we are deserving of. God in His rich mercy and grace instead poured out His wrath upon Jesus. There's two words that are really good Bible words for us to think about. One is expiation. Expiation. This is what Jesus did when he died on the cross of Calvary for us. He removed our guilt. If you think of X as an exit, as something leaving, something that is exiting, expiation literally is, is taking the guilt that was on our souls, the guilt that had characterized so much of our lives, the guilt that was drowning all of us in our sinfulness, and Jesus on the cross of Calvary and his mercy and his grace took that guilt and pulled it out from underneath us. He removed our guilt. The other word is propitiation. Propitiation is Jesus taking on something that ultimately should have been ours to take. And that was the wrath of our holy God. The song says, the wrath of God was satisfied as he poured it out upon his only begotten son. Listen, th this is something we need to be mindful of. There is a price to be paid for sin. Sin is not something that we play around with. Sin is not something that has no effect on our lives or has no effect on the lives of other people around us. Listen, sin is costly and sin is deadly. The wages of our sin is death. But Jesus in his mercy and in his grace died on the cross of Calvary and took our punishment on our behalf and praise be to God for that. Jesus is merciful. Kevin DeYoung said, as he was preaching on this, propitiation is used in the New Testament to describe the pacifying, placating, or appeasing of God's wrath. Justice must be carried out. God is righteous and just in all things, but he is also merciful. Mercy is taking the punishment that you and I deserved. Mercy is, is Jesus stepping in and saying, I'll pay the price for their sins. Mercy is Jesus stepping in and saying, put it on my account. I'll die. I'll take the punishment. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is merciful? The express image of his person upholding all things by his word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. Lastly, Jesus is greater. 
He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. I want to close with this. Everything that we experience in this world, everything that we see, everything that we go through, sometimes it's so immense, it's so overwhelming that we just can't even wrap our minds around how great this thing is. Good or bad, sometimes it's just massive, and it's hard to deal with, and it's something that we cannot control ourselves. There are things that are beyond our control as, as humans, things that we just can't wrap our minds around, things that we just don't have any say-so in how this goes in our life. Circumstances that are greater than ourselves, problems, issues of sin that, that are greater than, than ourselves. I'm reminded just how finite we are, just how feeble we are. Listen, even, even with all of the advances in medical technology, even with everything that we've done to, to try to extend life as far as we possibly can to live happy and healthy and whole lives, even with all the technological advancements in the world, listen, there will come a day when you will die, when all of this will end, and there's nothing that we can do about it. It seems something so great to us, something that we can't really overcome ourselves. And there are issues that, that you probably sit back and you think about, you know, with all of the things that we have at our disposal, with, with all of the advances in technology, there are some things that we just simply cannot control. The weather outside, we can't control it, especially in the south and in the summertime. <laughs> there's nothing, there's not much you can do about those things. There are issues in your life that are insurmountable problems that exist that you just can't control. They're greater than anything you could ever do. But can I tell you this? His word is true. Jesus is greater than all those things. He's greater than your problems. He's greater than your circumstances. Man, could you imagine right now if an angel just come came and and communicated to us, showed up in the middle of our worship service. And, and could you imagine just how in awe we would be of some sort of angelic being like that? And Hebrews tells us plainly that Jesus is so much greater than any of those angels. <laughs> Matter of fact, they, they're there to worship Him. They're there to glorify Him. Hebrews chapter 1 what we've just read really points to the fact that the Son is to be exalted above the angels. Even angelic beings, things of heaven that are hard to wrap our minds around. Listen, Jesus is so much greater. I love when he quotes the Old Testament here in verse 10. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. As immense as those things are, he says this, they will perish, but you remain. As immense and as powerful and as great as all of creation is, one day those things will come to an end. That Jesus will always be greater. Would you trust in him today? Let's pray together. God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for your word, first and for foremost, that you have revealed who you are to us. And God, you speak to us even right now through your word, and I pray that you would do a work in our heart as we respond in obedience to your word. Help us, God, no matter what we're facing, however immense, however great it may seem, Help us to be mindful of this fact that you are greater than all of those things. Lord, so many things seem insurmountable to us in our limited being, in our limited understanding. 
But God, there's nothing too great for you. There is nothing impossible with you. And God, I pray that we would trust in you today. That we would recognize what you have revealed to us in Scripture. And that we would live accordingly. That we would worship Jesus for who he is. As creator, God is all-powerful as the one who has purged our sins in his mercy and his grace has took on the wrath Lord that we deserved God help us to never lose sight of that help us God to never lose focus of the wonder of it all that you would save a poor wretched sinner like me God help us to live out our lives in complete obedience to you God, I pray if there's somebody here who's never accepted the gospel, they've never prayed, they've never acknowledged that they are sinful and that they need Jesus. God, I pray today they would walk this aisle, that they would come, that they would respond. Just as the little child did this past week at Vacation Bible School. God, we thank you that you're still saving souls. Lord, it's not a complicated message, but it's one that needs to be obeyed. Our sin has separated us from you. And in order for us to have a restored relationship with you, we need Jesus. Help us to trust and to believe in your word. We ask this in Jesus' name.